Now you can go. Okay. Um, so I'm super nervous right now, and I know you guys have been sitting all day, so <laughs> everyone just wants to take a deep breath with me. Before I start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, right. At the beginning of this program, I judged every word I said, afraid it would be wrong or rude or not good enough, not funny enough, that my peers would not think me worthy of attention and friendship and validation. I measured my worth with every laugh, with the words they would use to commend me or dismiss me. I punished my myself for jokes that fell flat, for comments during seminar that didn't sound smart enough, for being too serious or too weird. I was too much and not enough to contain myself. During our work project in South Africa, I wondered if I was asking Sandra, our caregiver, enough questions about her life and her patients. But I was so busy wondering if I was acting right that I forgot to be present in the experience of walking around with her during caregiving, much to the chagrin of my work partner, Ellie. I would let my mind wander as we sat in the disintegrating houses in the township of Kwanakatula, emotionally unable to handle the reality of the man who sat before us in the throes of, tubercul of tuberculosis, whose house reeked of urine, who spit blood into a stained handkerchief and let out throaty, lung splintering coughs, whose little children wandered around so lonely in that house that hung so heavy with death. After listening to Sandra attentively ask her, che her checkup questions and the clicks of COSA, my brain would drift off to lyrics of the song I loved or memories from back home or even focus on the South African TV channels that drank aimlessly in the background. It was not that I didn't want to be fully engaged in the experience of caregiving in South Africa. It was as if my brain put up this wall of protective distractions because it could not deal with the reality of what was happening. I could not be there. I did not have the strength to be present through all the monotonous pain contained in that family. There was a part of me that believed I did not have the strength to face things I was afraid of in a patient's house in Kwana or in my own head. Instead, I closed myself to the possibility that my internal monologue and the thoughts I had about myself were damaging and I fully embraced denial. Instead of thinking through what happened that day in my journal and processing it through discussion with my friends, I plied myself with peanut butter, a common TDB antidote to crappy situations, <laughs> and stored the memory in a corner of my brain, not to be opened until the tidal wave that was in India forced me to, to confront it. It was the coping mechanism I used often before the program, albeit with less peanut butter, mm -hmm. to deal with emotions and situations that had threatened to overwhelm me. Growing up in Silicon Valley, a fairly average student, I constantly felt inadequate next to my extraordinary peers. 2400s on SAT were a must. A significant portion of the graduating class every year would head off to Stanford, and the boy I had a crush on his dad was the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Because I publicly denounced subscribing to the ideals of our community, which were maintaining exemplary grades and impressive extracurriculars, and taking as many AP classes as possible, all while you pretending you lived a stress-free life and got seven hours of sleep and night, <laughs> I felt crushed under the weight of things I hadn't done, grades I didn't have, paralyzed by my own accusations of worthlessness. I was adrift in the, in the winds of others' perceptions of myself, unable to take a stand and decide the person I wanted to be. And while outwardly I lived a good life, had wonderfully supportive friends and parents, participated in sports and extracurriculars I loved, and worked fairly hard, I was consumed with insecurity and doubt about everything I did. This manifested in a low point during my junior year when I felt myself slipping into a depression and contracted an anxiety disorder. I say contracted, not to trivialize, trivialize mental illness, but because I truly do believe these things were like any other illness for me. And like other types of sickness, I did recover eventually. But during my period of mental illness, I found my world shrinking and my perspective about everything I loved faltering. I promised myself I would never go back to that place of depression and darkness, and I continue to wrestle my anxiety, though I've come to accept it as a part of myself. Although I may have recovered, I continued to struggle immensely with self-worth and confidence. The summer before my senior year, I was incredibly inspired while interning with the Global Health Organization, and I saw the effect of a good public health care system, which pushed me towards the path of TBD. However, I still had trouble believing that I was capable of even, of even fairly manageable tasks. It glorified others as being smarter, more beautiful, more hardworking, funnier, more exciting, and infinitely more interesting than I would ever be. That insecurity held me back from engaging with new people, checks for jobs I might have loved, even, even, from dealing, even from dealing with personal problems that made my life very difficult. I took my problems, shut them in a box, and let self-doubt rule my life. I was so afraid of all the things that could go right to risk that I preferred to do nothing at all. 
Not much of this was even conscious, though. I don't think I thought about the idea of worth once during this time, even as all these demeaning thoughts about myself flowed through my head. So I arrived at JFK in the morning of September 13th, 2015, excited for the promises of travel and, wish and witnessing new cultures, utterly unaware of the changes to come. Throughout most of South Africa, I had this feeling that tugged at my sleeve insistently whenever something felt difficult. Like, if this whole TVB thing didn't work out, if I failed at making genuine relationships, or too challenging, too changing, I could always go back to my comfortable, stagnant life at home. I had this moment of panic one night in South Africa when I realized that I was going to be irreparably altered by the experiences I was having, and that there was no going back to the place or the person I was. I began to understand that because of how much TV prioritized self-reflection, there was no running away from the things I had pushed down for so long, and that if I wanted to create meaningful change for others, I would have to start with myself. Like the pieces of my past, India was not something I wanted to have to transcend. I don't know how to describe India, and I feel like some things like this hazy mess of sadness, but that's not the case. It's really not something that can be encompassed with words. It's a sensation that can only be had by direct experience. That said, imagine more colors than you knew existed crossing the sky. Imagine every eye on the street turned towards you. Imagine the smell of a thousand motorcycles and men and tuk-tuks and cows all coexisting in the same street. Imagine the sound all of that would make. Imagine a place where your body is theirs to take. You are no longer protected by the culture you were born into. Your different looks and foreign clothes do not shield you from the wandering hands of strangers, from the smog and the smoke and a horizon the color of industrialism, from the ways that you as a woman will be silenced and treated as if you are not worthy of acknowledgement. At first, we saw the polarity of India with shining eyes. We wanted to soak up all of its differences and experience every moment as the reality that not all of the differences were positive, that the values of their culture sometimes directly contrasted ours, that we as women were seen as subhuman. We shrunk into our heads, letting our thoughts isolate us and rip the honeymoon bonds of South Africa apart. The connections that we had thought were so strong when there was nothing challenging us. There was no pretending in India. I kept trying to grasp at all these fading beliefs I had once held to be so true, and every uncertainty I had ever tried to hide from myself bubbled to the surface, unleashed by the constant harrowing of Paul and Forth. If I had felt inadequate before, I certainly didn't feel anywhere close to capable while teaching in India. I could not comprehend what we, as untrained students who had just graduated high school, were doing teaching these kids. At school, I felt the ropes of being complicit in oppression wrapping themselves around my heart, saw myself become someone I never wanted to be as a teacher, coercing children into rote memorization that I would have hated as a student. I felt myself escape through my voracious reading habits, disappearing into worlds of fiction when I couldn't face my reality. I felt like an ineffective, ineffective subjugator, more insecure than ever, and instead of being able to hide my problems, they were raw and red and open before me. I felt unsure about the person I, I was, about what I believed in, if or how I could affect change in these kids' lives, why I deserve to have the life I had while so many were stuck in an oppressive system they could not escape. I felt so conflicted, caught somewhere in between past and present selves and the contradictions in my future beliefs and previous opinions. I could not live within that duality with all the violence and beauty with my own criticisms and uncertainty about what damage I was doing. In South Africa, it had been so easy to, to escape a difficult day by getting on a 10-minute bus ride into downtown Platt to get a cappuccino, sit by the ocean, and forget that we had ever seen a terminally ill person, or at least put it off for a few hours. But in India, there was no escape, but to stare at the mountains and wish you could be up on one of those peaks and didn't have to deal with all the most heartbreaking parts of humanity that we confronted daily. You were forced to be present through the sheer magnitude of every experience. Instead of banding together against the shock of seeing children beaten in school and the unraveling stares of strange men, we each retreated into ourselves, wished for the comforts of home, and put on fronts of exaggerated positivity, only allowing our true thoughts to seep out into our journals or through eating obscene amounts of peanut butter and Nutella. <laughs> All the tendrils of smog and sexism and a culture that contrasted ours crawled up our throats and silenced us from expressing our hopes and fears that we felt. One night in Palangor, the village that we were staying in, unable to hold my world anymore, a simple how are you from Jenny, who at that time I barely knew, brought me to tears. I confessed everything that had been gnawing at my core, ravaging me to her on the balcony under a cold, starry sky and felt the break inside me. I told her my fears and insecurities and every wayward thought, 
and was shocked to hear that someone I had perceived to have it so together had experienced similar emotions. Suddenly, I felt so much less alone and simultaneously began to realize that having it together is a myth, that we are all freaking out all the time. Maybe it's just me, and I choose to tell myself that. <laughs> it was like a few pebbles tumbling down before an avalanche. I didn't want to run away from these emotions anymore. We listened to each other with empathy and openness, revealing every thorn that had been hidden beneath our skin. I felt so much more whole after this conversation. I realized I was so busy focusing on the kind of person I didn't want to be, obsessing over the qualities I hated, that I had not even considered what qualities I would like to embody. I realized that sitting in there in the school is the information that I could each day, um, and each day I lasted without having a breakdown. Um, that that kind of strength too, that I could be strong and brave, even though witnessing this oppression every day felt like a thousand steps back. It felt like healing in the most odd and uneven way. <clears throat> Just as we saw India with a sheen of newness at first, there were people we met along the journey who seemed incredible initially. It was only later we realized that they too had shoes. I had a long process of accepting that there were parts of me that I might dislike, just as there were parts of India and perhaps people there I didn't like. But that didn't mean that they weren't human. That didn't mean they weren't beautiful and that weren't deserving of love. It was their lives and their genetics and all their experiences that had molded them into the people in the country they were. And if I was changing, it meant that there was hope for change too. It sounds like I'm making these wild assumptions, which perhaps I am. <laughs> and trust me, I really wasn't sure of anything in India. I felt so country and the people, and the people in my life back home who had brought me so much hurt, and eventually accepted all of it for what it was, complex and flawed and whole and real. I began to come to terms with all of the duality within this country of contradictions, with the complexity of my own humanity and that of others. One day in Palanpur, the group took a hike up into the mountains to visit a Baba or a holy man at his temple. Some of us decided to go off trail and scrambled up a steep, exposed mountainside littered with boulders and scraggly pines. I measured the rapidly increasing altitude by the shortness of my breast. My legs felt like they'd break beneath me, and the sun bent our backs towards the earth. As we ascended, I thought about the idea of quitting. I wanted to so badly. <laughs> I thought about wanting to push myself in my body, about thinking that I couldn't do things and then going and doing them and vice versa. And how insane it was that we were hiking away is, that this was my life. I thought about the emotions I was experiencing, pain and anger and frustration and wonder at the magnificence of the mountains around me, how visceral and real it all felt. And how good it faced your emotions instead of dodging them as I had in the past. At the top of this seemingly endless hill, I stood in awe of our accomplishment and the pure joy I felt to how great it was to be alive, to witness the peaks and trees of Fallen Forth, all the wonders that I had seen and would see. And I could feel the chains roaring in my ears, sweeping me out and taking me to a way of thinking I never thought I would experience. The quiescence of Thailand allowed the storm that was India to, to die away, but, most, but almost gave us too much space to reflect on the people we were and the choices we, the choices we had made through the lens of agriculture and food. Studying the agricultural system in the peaceful village of John Deere and American food culture, or lack thereof, I was aghast with the deception by the media and the government as a way to further our capitalist consumerist society. I began to look at my beliefs about work in relation to food much more critically. I remember a day that we walked into a Western style mall in Chiang Mai, and I did feel overwhelmed by the hospital bright lights and hallways strewn with pictures of reach such like Caucasian people, setting the standards of beauty for a culture the American media would never try to understand, neo-colonialism at its subtlest. I felt fear at how controlled I had been and was by the images on those walls of people I could only strive towards but would never reach because they morphed into new, better people with the winds of the seasons. I wandered into the dressing room of H&M, determined to buy some new t-shirts to replace the ones that had fallen apart and then get the hell out of there. <laughs> Instead, I found myself noticing the damage each body a day had <laughs> reached upon my body, how my skin conditions had mangled my lips and limbs, and all the ways I would never live up to these improbable people plastered up on the walls of the mall. Why was it so difficult to look in the mirror any morning, every morning, <laughs> to see the roundness in my face, the strength from the wide wideness of my thighs that let me walk up all these mountains, and the curve of a stomach that would never yield flatness to me, no matter how much Pilates or hate I threw at it, 
no matter how many bowls of rice and acceptance I gave it. I realized then that inside or externally, in the mirror, my reflection dissolved behind a wall of shimmery tears, and I knew something in me had to end or begin or become something else. When I emerged from myself, from my dressing room of self pity, my goofy, absurdly kind friends established that we were all buying Christmas onesies from H&M. <laughs> and the rest of the afternoon was spent in delirious laughter at what a ridiculous group of misfits we are. Um, it was only later that we found out about H&M sweatshops, so please forgive us to TV. <laughs> <laughs> that night, mulling over the events of the day and feeling as low as ever, the phrase plus came into my head, and I immediately dismissed it with a cynical laugh at how self-healthy I was becoming. I felt incredibly selfish for even thinking this way after being exposed to problems that were so much more significant to many more people in South Africa and India and now Thailand. But as much as I wanted to dismiss my own issues, another part of me wanted so badly to understand what it would mean to have love for myself. In the coming days and months, I began to find joy in learning how to make natural pesticides and digging my hands into the earth, in my competitiveness during pickup soccer games at UHDP, in forages into the pantry for second dinner that ended with all of us breathless from earth. I let myself be taken in by the wonder of the yellow sunsets over the banana groves, by the difficulty of learning Thai and the patience our kind host on had with us, by the goofiness of 15 kids belting her girls in the back of a red truck in the middle of Chiang Mai. I felt what it meant to be present. I started to find worth not in spite of the soft-spoken voice I had always been self-conscious of, but because of it. I felt that my quiet voice was strong when I talked about issues I cared deeply for, that my words carried meaning and were worthy of being heard. I found so much love in my connections with the people on this trip. <laughs> felt my heart grow and muchness of the love and gratitude I held. I thought about the way we perceive others, how the things we tell ourselves are so much crueler than what we would say to another person, especially a person we cared about. And so instead of putting these feelings, I let myself experience them and appreciate that these moments were never going to happen again. I opened myself to let up all the quirks and let in the light. Thailand was like this one long, glorious high. I had finally started feeling acceptance with the person I was becoming and Cambodia hit with the full force of its history. I remember my legs carrying me out of the killing fields, the rest of me too stunned to function properly. <sighs> Wondering how people could forgive their country for something as horrific as a mass genocide. I wondered how our kind, enigmatic guy Boone could bring so much joy and laughter to others after his past as a child soldier. Why, if there was a woman sleeping with her two children on a thin blanket on the street corner outside our hotel, while well, rich white tourists drank margaritas at cafes next to her, could I even think about my own problems? They were minuscule in comparison. But then again, who could I expect to help if I was still stuck on my own issues? How could I help anyone if I didn't believe I had the strength or ability to give? Who did I think I was wanting to solve the difficulties of another country when there were so many problems in my own? I thought that if the people of Cambodia could transcend the nightmares of their past, I could sure as hell muster the courage to forgive myself and the people in mine. When I look back now, my past selves feel like a blurry face in a fogged up mirror. I can never quite tell what they're thinking, where they want to go, what their goals and hopes and fears are. I found that these things I carried with me through the adventure that was TVB have fallen away to reveal newer truths. <laughs> I just lost my <laughs> Perhaps when I did not believe in myself, I really wasn't capable of all the things I aspire to do. All my life, and especially in most recent years, I've been drawn to people living wildly adventurous lives and daring to fail. And I don't think I ever seriously considered I could be one of them. And now realizing how, how silly that is, I feel so different from the person who came on this program. I found that issues I previously was so sensitized to feel less acute. Perhaps I can look at them more objectively now. In my life right now, feels like it's at such a crossroads. There are so many unknown paths ahead of me, so many versions of myself yet unexplored. The future and uncertainty and getting my first real job and learning how to do taxes and starting to believe <laughs> I'm capable of finishing things, running a half marathon, and having absolutely zero clue what I'm doing for the rest of my gap year, let alone where I'm going to college. That all scares the shit out of me. <laughs> 
And I think having that and knowing <laughs> and choo choosing to do something is what's important because paralysis seems far too boring. I still don't know that I found a center because I now hope that my changing. I have this sense of voice, this voice I can ask all these questions with, that I can voice my fears with, that I can admit my flaws with, and grow from a place of humble curiosity. When I think about the wealth of this trip, I think about those conversations we had that let us see underneath the surfaces that we have at first presented each other with. I think how much we grew from the ways in which we were vulnerable. I think of all the laughs we used to cope. I think of the love I have for these 17 perfectly imperfect people. I think of all the questions. I am left standing with open hands. I don't have the perfect set of conclusions from this trip that I assumed I would. Instead, all these ideas I thought I would have cemented. Instead, I'm left with a thousand more questions and a constantly shifting center. The more I see of it, the more confusing a place the world seems to me. There is still so much I have to learn and to feel and to know. I think a belief that I've come to hold is that there's power to be had in deconstructing yourself and looking at all the broken pieces of yourself and reassembling them and realizing that truly you've been worthy this entire time. You just never would have realized it with all, without all the things it to get to this point. You never would have had all these experiences to shape and mold you into the aware, vulnerable, so very worthy person that you are. You never have realized that the journey, the learning, that was everything. I believe in this type of power. <laughs> in power rising from the ashes and the mud, in humble beginnings and acknowledging failure, power deriving from the strength it takes to be imperfect. Thank you.